Howdy. What? It's now been around 100 years since Walt Disney first founded his company. In that time, a lot of Disney's media has been hidden away or lost completely. And in this video, I'd like to try and cover the media that remains lost to time and the Disney media that's been found in recent years. And since there are so many mysteries to talk about, let's do this in iceberg format. But when it comes to mysteries and dark media, you may already know, I always like to invite my good friend. Hey, Shredder. It's good to be back. Hey, George. Welcome back, my friend. When you're ready, let's begin. Like most iceberg videos, we'll start with the surface, which has some of the most well-known lost media, and we'll slowly work our way down, diving deeper to get some of the more strange, obscure lost media. Some of these choices are from my own experience, but many are from other sources such as the Lost Media Wiki or Iceberg Charts. And thank you to those websites for all the information. Anyway, let's dive into this iceberg. Let's start with level one, the surface. Inside Out, deleted Bing Bong death scene. For many people, the death of Bing Bong in Inside Out was a very sad moment. When Joy and Bing Bong end up in Riley's memory dump, they attempt to use Bing Bong's rocket to fly out, but they're too heavy until Bing Bong gets off the rocket. In the original cut, after Bing Bong sacrifices himself to save Joy, the death of Bing Bong was about 40 to 50 seconds longer. Instead in this scene, Bing Bong sits pleading at the bottom of the blackness, and Joy watches him sadly as his body fades away. Although many people thought this version was better, the scene was thought to be too upsetting, and it was cut from the film. And to be fair, even the voice actor of Bing Bong was tearing up in the booth as he did the death scene. Take her to the moon for me, okay? And while the scenes never hit me that deeply, it's obviously a scene that hit many people right in the feels. Apparently, the scene was never publicly released, and not even on Blu-rays as a deleted scene. Until 2021, it never surfaced. But then, it was partially released as a seven second clip. But the full scene has faded into obscurity. Though Inside Out actually has a couple of deleted scenes that are still viewable. Such as Bing Bong showing Joy the <laughs> swear word library or the sarcasm generator. Turns out Bing Bong was actually a radical revolutionary and throws a brick at the construction workers. It's actually a pretty awesome scene. Anyway, Mickey Mouse in Vietnam. During wartime in 1968, Lee Savage, who was the father of Mythbusters star Adam Savage, collaborated with Milton Glaser, who was responsible for famous logos such as DC. Together, they produced a short, silent film of Mickey Mouse going to Vietnam War. Yeah, seriously, they did that. The film was just over a minute long. It showed Mickey, as a happy-go-lucky recruit, going to war by boat. Unfortunately, Mickey is immediately shot in the head on arrival, and the film abruptly ends there. Apparently, the point of the film was meant as a protest towards the ongoing Vietnam War. But perhaps surprisingly, Disney wasn't impressed by seeing Mickey shot in the head. And records said they obtained and destroyed any evidence of the short. Well, clearly they left some evidence of the short, because we're looking at it right now. You see, the film re-emerged at the 2010 Sarajevo Film Festival, and then again in 2018, when a YouTuber found, ripped, and uploaded a copy of the film. I've linked it in the description if you are curious. Toy Story Black Friday Reel in Toy Story, most people see Woody as the nice guy. But originally, Woody was very much meant to be the villain. Do you remember the scene where Woody accidentally knocks Buzz out the window? Well, some people do think there was some intention there. But in the original cuts, there was no question about it. Woody very intentionally knocks Buzz out the window. In fact, he throws him out the window himself. I'd just like to wish you luck. I, I, I know you'd do the same for me. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Whoa! Oh! On a side note, I really like this original voice actor for Bo Peep. She delivers so much personality to the role. Woody, you deliberately threw Buzz out the window. Hey, it's a toy, toy world. In the original plot, Woody was a ruthless dictator to the other toys. He was cruel and callous for the sake of it. When the other toys turned on him, you were kind of rooting for them. It was almost like they were trying to overthrow their evil dictator. Apparently, both Disney and Tom Hanks disliked evil Woody's character and nearly caused the entire film to be cancelled. It turns out Katzenberg, the co-founder of DreamWorks, made this version of Woody. I think that makes sense, as I think this Woody probably would have worked well in, say, Shrek, but less so in a Disney Pixar movie. The original Frozen with villain Elsa. For years, pretty much until the last minute, Elsa was cast as the villain of Frozen. 
She was a jilted bride who froze her own heart. She desired revenge and froze Arendelle as well. Her plan was to destroy Arendelle and everyone who lived there by freezing their hearts. Anyone who dared to come to her mountain suffered the wrath of the Ice Queen. She even had plans to kidnap Anna on her wedding day. What did I ever do to you? Admittedly, if Anna was still marrying Hans, Elsa probably would have been doing her a favor. Still, kind of a jerk move. This was until the song Let It Go was composed. This caused Elsa's character to completely change. The song depicted a more sympathetic version of Elsa, and this pushed the producers to change Elsa to match this. Let It Go was seen as such a powerful analogy for being freed of anxiety and social constraints that the writers shifted the entire story around it. Instead, Anna and Elsa were made into sisters, and they instead had a storyline about the bond of sisterhood, and the sisters' act of love saving the kingdom from perpetual draftiness. Another example is the 2004 version of Elsa from Anna and the Snow Queen. Fortunately, some pictures of it still remain. Ah, oh, this one. I actually really would have loved to see this version. Apparently, it had a stronger comedy element, and this blue skin version of Elsa is dripping with personality. Though, even if it's overplayed, I think the final version of Frozen we got was a lot of fun too. Though I think we could use a little less Olaf. Oh, look at that. I've been impaled. The shock collar from Zootopia. The original version of Zootopia was very, very different to what we got in the final film. The final film focused on discussing racial discrimination, but originally the discrimination was much less subtle. Zootopia used shock collars to tame its citizens, specifically citizens that were deemed predators. It was pretty grim. The collar couldn't tell the difference between anger or just excitement and joy. If the animal showed any too intense an emotion, the result was the same. The collar zapped its wearer. At a young age, every predator child would have their taming ceremony. And it's exactly what it sounds like. They have a collar attached to their neck, and from then on and forevermore, they have to watch their emotions or be zapped. I personally felt this would have made for a very powerful, memorable plot point, and may well have put Zootopia among Disney's darkest films. But Pixar reviewers had a lot of negative feedback. They felt it was hard to like the city of Zootopia if it was willing to treat its citizens this way. And by Judy being a police officer, she was being more villainous by enforcing these shock collars. And I get all that, but damn, these shock collars gave the story some teeth. Based on Pixar's feedback, all references to the collar were removed. This meant a lot of rewriting of the plots, and plenty of deleted scenes, such as one where Nick is getting his collar removed for a medical test. There was also Nick's predator theme park, Wild Times, as well as a deleted scene of a taming party of a young bear which is actually one of the most sad yet powerful scenes I've seen in a Disney movie. And I'll always think it's a shame to see the plot of the Taming Collar removed from Zootopia. Pinocchio, Lost Bugs Bunny Dialogue. Originally, Gideon the Cat from Pinocchio was played by Mel Blanc, the voice of Bugs Bunny. Say God, are you trying to get yourself in trouble with the law? But the original scene he spoke in was deleted. In the final film, all that remains of Blank's lines were three hiccups. <laughs> According to an interview with Mel Blank, he had given Gideon a drunken voice. This Pinocchio deleted scene has never resurfaced on the internet. Fantasia 3. There was actually a third movie planned for Fantasia. Like the sequel, Fantasia 2000, the threequel had an equally original title, Fantasia 2006. But Fantasia 3 was unique in that it was going to feature music from all around the world. Unfortunately, the movie was cancelled when Treasure Planet completely bombed at the box office. At the time, Disney's hand-drawn animation movies were underperforming. Yeah, we're in the early 2000s, where hand-drawn animation was still seen as quote-unquote kid stuff, while CG animation was seen as more for the whole family. In reality, this is obviously not true, but Disney couldn't argue with desolate movie theaters, so Fantasia 3 was pulled. It was actually in production for two years before being cancelled, and luckily, some of the footage of the movie has surfaced. One of the completed segments was called Destino, or Destino. Unlike previous Fantasia songs, this one used both vocals and instruments. A total of four segments were found. I took a look at Destino, and honestly, I was absolutely blown away. 
This Fantasia project actually began in 1945, 58 years before its completion. Destino was originally a collaboration between Walt Disney and a Spanish surrealist painter, Salvador Dali, but it was abandoned during the financial woes of World War II. Luckily, Walt's nephew Roy dug up this dead project during Fantasia 2000 and resurrected his uncle's dream. This is among the most beautiful Fantasia segments I've ever seen, gorgeously combining the modern French animation and CG of Disney with Mexican music, vocals, and a distinct surrealist art style. Though I should probably quickly address the elephant in the thumbnail, or the twin alien troll hybrids in the thumbnail. These are among the cryptic, but beautiful imagery deciphered from the original 1945 storyboard. Although I can't verbally explain everything I'm seeing in Destino, perhaps I don't need to. And it was an outright crime to see Fantasia 3 segments like this not get more attention. Runaway Brain In recent decades, Disney has tried their best to keep this movie under lock and key. But the reason they've done this is vague at best. Back in the 90s, a lot of Disney movies just weren't pulling in the numbers. So Disney wanted to reinvent Mickey Mouse. The result was Runaway Brain. This is actually my favorite version of Mickey. In Runaway Brain, Mickey has to chase down his rampaging body after he switches minds with Pete. The movie itself is a lot of fun, and even today, it still looks gorgeous. It has a lot of fans that miss it, and would love to get it on DVD or Blu-ray. But Disney has tried hard over the past decades to erase it from existence. I personally think this is because of how Mickey is presented visually rather than how he actually is. Although Mickey's mind remains normal, he's clear-headed in rescuing Minnie. His body is a mess. He's destroying shops and attempting to grab Minnie. Personally, I think the whole thing is fascinating and I love this episode. I think it's a big jerk move of Disney to hide this episode. Uh, Strider, you realize this may be partially your fault, right? What? My fault? You, you know, you might be right. I could well be at least a little to blame. Five years ago, my Darkest Mickey cartoons video advertised Runaway Brain. Evil Mickey was in the thumbnail and everything, and it did paint Mickey in a darker light, at least visually. Well, what do you have to say to the viewer? I... I'm sorry for helping this Mickey movie become lost media. I'll go sit in the corner. Oswald the Lucky Rabbit Episodes In 1927, before Walt had even created Mickey Mouse, his original animated star child was Oswald the Rabbit, even before Oswald was Alice, but Oswald was the first animated character, with personality anyway. Walt had originally made Oswald while under contract with Universal Studios. Walt introduced Oswald with the short Trolley Troubles, but when Walt's contract expired with Universal in 1928, he went on to create Mickey Mouse. A total of 26 Oswald shorts were created, but unfortunately, in 1948, Universal Studios went on to burn their silent film collection. But modern Disney has crap tons of money. So Disney reacquired Oswald in 2008. 17 shorts were found and they were released on DVD, but nine of the Oswald shorts remain missing. The missing shorts include Hot Dog, The Banker's Daughter, Rickety Gin, Harem Scarum, Sagebrush Sadie, and Ride on Plowboy. As of this video, these animations are believed to be lost. Kingdom Hearts Animated Pilot Kingdom Hearts has a massive cult following, and some people have wondered why it hasn't been made into a series. Well, it turns out, a series pilot was made. It was made by Seth Kersley, also known for the Looney Tunes show, and sadly, Eight Crazy Nights, one of the worst animated films of all time. My socks. <laughs> Must be game time. But I liked the Looney Tunes show, so let's give this pilot the benefit of the doubt. In an interview, the creator Seth stated, I don't claim rights to this except it's my work. Mine. I'm not profiting from it, but I want to show my work. This movie is flawed, which I have no doubt will be pointed out. But I was really proud of the story we put together. Yeah. Personally, I really like this pilot. It got straight to the point and did a good job keeping the Kingdom's Heart story coherent. And that's no small task. In this place to find is to lose, and to lose is to find. 
Oh, that sucks. Apparently, this pilot tested well with test audiences too. But despite this, Disney shelved it anyway. Why it was shelved is a mystery to me. Rather than going over 20 games over 15 years of needlessly complicated, over-pompous lore, why can't we just watch an animated series? Money! Oh yeah, Disney has tried removing this pilot off YouTube a few times, but once something's put on the internet, it's near impossible to remove it. Disney Infinity 4. The original Disney Infinity games were very successful, and they fully capitalized on the Toys to Life fad. Go get him, Spyro! Well, until the fad died down. In case you'd like a brief refresh, the Disney Infinity series were sandbox adventure games that could be accessed with toys. Kind of like Amiibo. And Disney Infinity 4 was in production for a while. But then the great Toys to Life crash happened, and it just decimated the market. As I mentioned in Nintendo Failures, each toy brand dropped out one by one. First to drop out was LEGO Dimensions, then Disney Infinity, then Nintendo Amiibos, and then finally, Spyro Skylanders. Sales were rapidly declining for Disney Infinity toys. In fact, Disney lost about $147 million due to Disney Infinity 3 not performing well. So the writing was on the wall. The Toys to Life fad was officially over. So all the Disney Infinity 1, 2, and 3 servers were shut down. The sales decline was so huge that Disney had to completely shut down Infinity's production company, Avalanche Software along with all of their other video game divisions. Jeebus, that's some bad sales right there. Disney Infinity 4 was going to include Coco, Cars 3, Star Wars Rogue One, Guardians of the Galaxy 2, and Thor Ragnarok. There was also some Avatar concept art, so I guess that visual fairy floss would have been in the game too. But as of now, the only Disney Infinity 4 footage I could find was this pre-alpha footage. Great job, little genie guy. <laughs> Alice in Wonderland, the original movie. Nearly a century ago in the 1930s, Walt planned to make Alice in Wonderland the first ever Disney movie. But unfortunately, the film didn't make it to screens until 1951. The film had many drafts written, rewritten, and rejected before the final film was released. The original 1939 draft was seen as too frightening by Walt. The overall tone was also very grim. Many of the characters were more monstrous and bloodthirsty. For example, the Mad Hatter and March originally attempted to cut Alice into pieces with scissors and knives. Alice was even placed in a guillotine near the end of the movie. Though I guess this makes sense given this queen was always exclaiming, OFF WITH THEIR HEADS! Very little footage remains of the 1939 original, but some concept art has been found, such as this one sold at Heritage Auctions, where Alice stands by the executioner. This original version of the film was also animated more closely to the original 1865 book, which Walt considered too difficult to animate. For the final film, Walt went with a lighter, more family-friendly tone. Family-friendly, there's that word again. And again, not the last time we hear that word causing a problem in production. The Lion King deleted ending. Originally, Lion King was going to have a different ending. According to the Disney Wiki, the ending was deemed too horrific and was changed relatively late in production. In the scene, Simba is holding Scar on Pride Rock. He's basically one. Then Simba acts a little too gullible and spares Scar. And surprising no one but Simba, I'm guessing, Scar then proceeds to throw him off the cliff. Simba survives by landing on some bushes, but Scar finds the situation so hilarious that he doesn't even notice he's being burned alive by the fire. Some people call this ending darker, but I actually kind of disagree. In the final ending we got, it appeared to me that Scar was torn apart and eaten by hyenas alive. So I'd argue the final ending was just as dark. The original Emperor's New Groove, Kingdom of the Sun. I've got to at least mention this one. Emperor's New Groove is among my favorite Disney movies. Ha! Boom, baby! Originally, though, it had a very different story with a very different feel. The original movie was called Kingdom of the Sun and was completely different to what we got. It was kind of like a parent trap sort of scenario where two people switch lives. The hero was Pacha, an 18-year-old llama herder with infection for the sun. He meets the greedy Emperor Manco, and the two, bored with their current lives, decide to switch lives. But the true stars of the Emperor's New Groove were, of course, the villains, Yzma and Kronk. And Yzma was one character that stayed consistent throughout the movies. Pull the lever, Kronk. 
She's still a laugh, and she still tries to turn the Emperor into a llama, and she still tries to take over the throne, but this time using the powers of the dark god Supai. The movie was cancelled very late in production, so there was a lot of cut content we can find, such as a song One Day She'll Love Me or Walk the Llama. But probably my favourite song is Snuff Out the Light. It's so brimming with energy. And seeing Yzma as more of a dark necromancer sorcerer was actually really interesting. Eartha Kitt as Yzma has to be one of my favourite voice actor performances in all of Disney. If you're curious, I've attached a song in the description. Personally, I would have paid to see both versions of this spectacular movie. Bambi meets Godzilla. Similar to Mickey in Vietnam, this is an old 1969 animation project starring Bambi. Bambi meets Godzilla? I can't wait to see how this amazing matchup go- Oh, never mind. The writers also very thoughtfully acknowledge the city of Tokyo for their help in obtaining the true star of the film, Godzilla. Very thoughtful. The Jungle Book original version. Originally, Disney's Jungle Book movie was written by Bill Pitt. He had a darker take on the movie that more closely resembled the original book, but he abandoned the project and left Disney when Walt pushed him to make the story more family friendly. Ah oh dear. You may remember this same issue with Alice in Wonderland, and you'll find this is a recurring problem in these cancelled Disney movies. They may have also been having personal quarrels as well, but I don't know the exact details of their argument. In the final version of Jungle Book, with the exception of Shere Khan and Ka, most animals in the forest didn't try to kill Mowgli, but in the original Bell Pete version of the movie, almost everything was out to kill him. When he's abandoned as an infant, the wolves originally barely managed to save him from being killed falling down a waterfall and the elephants he meet threaten to kill him if he doesn't leave the jungle. In another deleted scene, a rhino smells Mowgli and just tries to charge and rend him asunder. I actually prefer this depiction of the jungle, as I feel it paints a more realistic version of the forest that I know. Yes, nature can be beautiful, and the forest is my favourite place to be, but nature is also completely indifferent to the survival of humanity. It can be a gruesome, ruthless place, where caution and vigilance is required. I'll find you Mando, wherever you are. Bragira also points out that originally, jungle animals directly attacked the man village, and this is what caused humans to let loose fire, or man's red flower, on the forest. And I think this is more realistic. It better resembles a complicated, nuanced story like Princess Mononoke by Studio Miyazaki. Despite what Avatar might have us believe, not all people burn down forests for greed and just gold, gold, gold. Sometimes, an atrocity can be an act of retaliation, self-defense, or survival. And seeing the animals attack man first adds nuance to the struggle for both man and animals to coexist. Anyway, as of now, only some poor quality footage of the original movie exists. Disney Channel pop-up movies. During the 2000s and 2010s, Disney Channel played pop-up editions of some of their movies. This included the High School Musical movies, The Cheetah Girls, and Wizards of Waverly Place. These versions of the movies had pop-up facts that talked about why the writers did certain things, or funny things the actors said on set. So a bit like an audio commentary on a DVD or something, but visual. However, these special editions only aired once or twice. Only one pop-up movie exists on DVD. So as of now, most of these pop-up movies are lost. Enchanted Deleted Song Enchanted was a Disney movie about 1960 Disney characters coming to our real world. I say 1960s Disney because they had all that optimism, sing-along drama, hamminess and cringe that you'd expect. But the movie did have a nice heart to it, and a nice message about what both worlds could learn from each other. Three of the movie's songs actually scored Best Oscar nominations, including my personal favourite, That's How You Know. However, the title song Enchanted doesn't appear in the final film. Ironically, the cancelled song was sung by Indina Menzel, also known as Elsa, who sung Let It Go, which, even if overplayed, is still a beautifully sung song. But without the title song Enchanted, Elsa ends up with zero singing performances in the movie, which, given her opera background in Wicked, seemed like a real waste. Though they tried to make up for this in Enchanted's mediocre sequel by having her sing a solo number. The sequel was so bad to me that Elsa's song is basically the only thing I remember of the movie. So there you go. The Lizzie McGuire Revival. Nothing gives me that early 2000s nostalgia quite like Lizzie McGuire. It still holds a special place in my heart. I don't necessarily think all the episodes were good, but still very nostalgic for me. And originally, I was in for a treat as Lizzie McGuire was announced to have a revival in 2019. The revival would have aired on Disney Plus. 
Unfortunately, the production was halted due to quote-unquote creative differences, and you can probably guess what those differences were. Yep, you got it. It wasn't family-friendly enough. Hilary Duff, Lizzie McGuire's actor, made an announcement of the cancellation on her Instagram. I know the efforts and conversations have been everywhere trying to make a reboot work, but sadly, despite our best efforts, it's not going to happen. I want any reboot of Lizzie to be honest and authentic of who Lizzie would be today. Hey now, this is what 2020 is made of. Sorry! Well, I mean, she's not wrong. For many people, that year was a dumpster fire. The series would have followed Lizzie as a 30-year-old interior decorator. She was living in an apartment in New York and had just gotten engaged, but she discovers she's being cheated on and decides to return to LA. Seeing Lizzie go through the challenges of adulthood would have been really interesting and relatable to me. And given Hilary Duff's 24 million followers, I'm pretty dang sure this revival would have had viewership, but respects to their team for wanting to make sure the show was as high quality as possible. Personally, as a 30-year-old who grew up with the series, I would have wanted to see the reality Lizzie was facing today. And reality isn't always family friendly. In fact, this is exactly what Hilary Duff wanted too. And entering your 30s is a really big deal. And I think it's just the right time for her to step back in and to have her go along with you in your 30s. Since its cancellation, no footage or plot details were ever released, except for this two seconds of footage from a Disney Plus advert. Hi. It's me. While the two completed episodes might exist somewhere, as of this video, they haven't been made publicly available. Hilary Duff said in an article that she was grateful the episodes were completed, so at least she got to have that experience of stepping into Lizzie's shoes one last time. Fantasia, original audio and censored scenes. I'm a huge fan of this movie, and I've looked hard for many years to find the original audio for Deems Taylor. You see, supposedly, the original Roadshow audio of this movie was lost a very long time ago. The narrator, Deems Taylor's original extended audio came from 1940, so 64 years later, the audio had deteriorated so much that Disney deemed the damage irreversible. Though small portions remain, Many of Fantasia's original monologues have been lost in the last century. So in 2004, Deem Taylor's voice was dubbed over by the actor Corey Burton, and he does give a good voice performance. Rather amiable and easy to get along with. However, there were bullies and gangsters among them. But I remember an old VHS I used to have of Fantasia, and the original voice of Deem Taylor was on there, and it had a sense of power and majesty to it that was irreplaceable. What you're going to see are the designs and pictures and stories that music inspired in the minds and imaginations of a group of artists. As for the censored scenes in Fantasia, the main censored scenes were due to the deleted character, Sunflower. She seemed to be a kind-hearted character, but sadly, she was also a very racist caricature. She was an African-American slave who served the white centaurs. She is generally seen cleaning up after the centaurs or grooming them. She was portrayed as short, clunky, and she had big lips, which was sadly a common racial caricature for African Americans at the time. There was also another African American slave named Otica, who was portrayed very similarly. In 1969, both Sunflower and Otica were censored and removed from all scenes in Fantasia but some copies of the footage do remain accessible and were uploaded to the internet. Personally, I prefer Warner Brothers' approach with censorship. I think Whoopi Goldberg summarizes it perfectly. Man, she's a delight. But removing these inexcusable images and jokes from this collection would be the same as saying they never existed. So they are presented here to accurately reflect a part of our history that cannot and should not be ignored. The Alice Comedies. Somehow, the ideas of cartoons interacting with the real world still feels like a fresh concept to me. Yet, this is actually an ancient concept. Because 100 years ago, in 1923, before Mickey, before even Oswald, Walt Disney produced something even stranger. He produced a silent film series known as The Alice Comedies. It was essentially Who Framed Roger Rabbit 65 years earlier and it was just as bizarre as you might imagine. The film starred Alice. She was played by a live action actor, yet she often lived in an animated world. The very first short was known as Alice's Wonderland, vaguely based off the book of the same name. Given that some of these shorts are over 100 years old, it's likely the lost episodes will never be found. But that being said, we can never underestimate the internet. This episode starts with Alice sitting down with a very young Walt Disney, 
to see some of his animation come to life. And when she dreams that night, she enters the animation world. But once Walt had completed this Alice short, the studio went bankrupt. Fortunately, Winkler Pictures had just lost Felix the Cat, and they needed a replacement. And Walt's very weird Alice shorts were just the tickets, apparently. Many of these films have been lost, but uh, fortunately, some have been recovered. Some of these recovered shorts include Alice's Day at Sea. In this short, Alice rides in a car driven by a dog, and then dreams of floating to an island of dancing fish. Sure, why not? Uh, I guess in the 1920s, plot coherence hadn't been invented yet. Welcome to Pooh Corner. Welcome to Pooh Corner is a partially found, very old Disney Channel show. I still remember watching this show on cassette tape as a kid. Admittedly, it, it wasn't that pretty. The show had live action actors in suits, hamming it up playing characters from the Hundred Acre Wood. They gave a decent performance, but unfortunately, Pooh's suit in particular had that creepy thousand yard stare. I suspect nowadays, this Pooh would give kids nightmares. The show had some nice morals, such as trying new things and trying to find the bright side on difficult days. But damn, this show was hit by the ugly side of an ugly stick. It's ugly. Many of the episodes have been lost, but some have been recovered from old tapes from the 80s. I also had some episodes on tape from the 80s version of the Disney Channel. Though obviously, I never thought to preserve them at the time. Which is a shame, because I'd love to have helped contribute to lost media. Mickey and Minnie Mouse Lost Fornication Tape There was a documentary years ago where a Disney animator was interviewed. He said that a special tape was made for Walt at his birthday celebration in 1936. Two Disney animators had put together a tape of Mickey and Minnie Mouse fornicating. What the hell did you just say? And this tape was shown to a bunch of amused onlookers and Walt. Onlookers were amused and they all got a good laugh. At the end, Walt stood up and he said, That was great. That was fabulous animation. Who did that? An animator raises their hand. Me! Me! I did it! It was me! Did you like it? No! You're fired! Aww. Disney fired them on the spot. Ooh, I also mentioned this in my lost Disney cartoons video. Supposedly all known copies of the tape were destroyed. Because the tape was reported by a Disney animator, this gives the claim an air of credibility. The same documentary mentions that Disney didn't want anything that even slightly smacked of sexuality in the workplace. Apparently, Walt even sent around a memo to all the women in his office saying, mm, well, Nin, honey, would you mind helping me read this? Sure, honey. The men who are married at Disney are happily married, and we want all of the girls to understand that. Ugh, you, you probably noticed by now, this is where that whole quote-unquote family-friendly obsession starts, right at its root with Walt Disney. Walt planted these family-friendly seeds into Disney in the 1930s. And while obviously we don't want kids watching fornication tapes of Mickey and Minnie, the complete abstinence from anything that even slightly smacks of human sensuality just bugs me. In the world of Disney, uh, supposedly people are born, but we have no idea how it happens. A forbidden love! Uncle Walt. In 1964, an unauthorized Disney short was made by the animator Robert Swarth as part of a UCLA animation workshop. Only one public screening of the film ever took place at the American Film Institute. The film begins with images of Walt Disney at various ages. We also see a very early style Mickey and Minnie Mouse, very racist caricatures and toilet humor for some reason. After this, the film shows the female centaurs from Fantasia working in a red light district, with Goofy working as their pimp. Uh, okay. After that, it shows various disturbing scenes from Disney films, such as the Queen transforming into the Hag from Snow White, or the donkey scene in Pleasure Island from Pinocchio, or the dinosaurs dying in Fantasia, or Schoenabog in Night on Bald Mountain, all the while some rabbit children look on in horror. The final parts of the film show the seven dwarves from Snow White gathering around Mickey in a mouse cum mausoleum, similar to the funeral scene in Snow White. Uncle Wall has not been publicly screened since 1972, and it is unknown if anyone other than Robert even has a copy of the film. Walt, the pointer. Walt loved Mickey Mouse a lot. In fact, his animators are gone on record saying he once said, 
I love Mickey Mouse more than any woman I've ever known. In fact, there was a time when Walt became Mickey Mouse. Yeah, <laughs> me I guess. <laughs> While Walt regularly voice acted as Mickey, perhaps the holy grail of lost Disney footage was Walt performing the scenes as Mickey Mouse in The Pointer. He put on a hunter's hat, dressed up, and was the animation reference for Mickey Mouse. Disney was reluctant to perform, but eventually agreed if the camera was far away, and if no animators stared at him, he was very embarrassed. And Disney refused to ever do this again. A few years later, when the animators tried to look for the footage, it had mysteriously disappeared. My personal guess is Walt disposed of it himself. He probably did, and to this day, the footage remains completely lost. And with that, we've reached the bottom of this iceberg. Though let me know in the comments if you think we've missed any other Disney lost or found media. And thank you for the help, George. Did you know we've actually been collaborating for over five years now? And every time, it's an honor to have your help. Always a pleasure, Strider. It's fun working with you and I look forward to next time. And as always, thanks for watching. And hopefully, I might see you next time. Today's member question is from Danielle, and she asks, What interested you in making videos on YouTube? Weirdly, I just started by wanting to do a review of Dragon Ball GT, and I was really passionate about Futurama and made a top 10 list. 